You are watching A-Level SOS and this is Processors and Parallel Processing. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you like the videos and the channel, you could head to alevelsos.com, hit the coffee icon here, or just go to buymeacoffee.com A-Level SOS. And here you can se select an amount that you like to donate and donate that much. You can also select this option where you can have a one-to-one -one session with me and we can discuss a topic of your choice we can cover a chapter so on for today's chapter go to a level sos.com and over there go to notes and resources computer science and hit processor and parallel processing here you'll find the notes for today's chapter and if all right let's first start by looking at the history of processors you don't need to remember everything but it's always better to know a little bit more so in 1902, Nicholas Tesla invented the first electronic and logic gate. The first transistor was then discovered about 40 years later. Uh, transistors, as you know, are the building blocks for processors. In 1958, the first working integrated circuit was developed. Soon later, in 1959, IBM developed the first automatic mass production facility for transistors. This is a big step because we're now mass producing things. 1968, Intel was founded. Soon later, AMD was founded. Then the Intel 4004 came, big step. In 1971, it was the first microprocessor that Intel had launched. It performed 60,000 operations per second. Intel then released uh, the 8008. A year later, Motorola then released its own processor. Two years later, Intel went on improving it with the 880 chipset. The MOS technology was then founded in 1975. We won't talk much about the MOS technology, but it was then later improved just that same year. And from 1960-76 to now, a lot of new processors have come up, a lot of new architectures, a lot of new things to know. But we won't look at all of that in detail. Let's get started with the architectures. All right, so there are two kinds of processors, CISC and RISC. Complex instruction set computers and reduced instruction set computers. Now, CISC itself has four types, four subcategories MIMD, MISD, SIMD, and SISD. These are similar for RISC as well. Let's just look at them. Multiple instruction, multiple data is MIMD. MISD is multiple instruction, single data. SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. And SISD is single instruction, single data. So, as you can see, reduced instruction computer set has the same sort of um, subcategory categories for processors MIMD, MISD, SIMD, SISD. It's basically talking about instruction sets and data sets. So either you have multiple instructions or single instructions or multiple data or single data and everything is a combination of these two. So basically two into two we have four sorts of combinations. Alright so these are pretty crucial to know the differences between RISC and CISC processors. So as we saw, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer and CISC stands for Complex Instruction Set Computers. RISC has fewer addressing modes, uh, while CISC, as it says, the name is complex, has more addressing modes. RISC has simpler instructions and CISC has more complex instructions. RISC is better for pipeline ability, which we'll see what it is a, later, a bit later on. CISC has rather poor pipeline ability. RISC requires more less complex circuits. CISC, of course, requires more complex circuits. RISC has fewer instructions, complex instruction set, which means CISC has more instructions. RISC uses fixed length instructions, and CISC uses variable length instructions. RISC needs many registers, but CISC only needs a few. RISC has fewer instruction formats. CISC has many of them. RISC uses more RAM, while CISC uses more cache. RISC uses load and stored instructions to address memory, while CISC has many types of instructions to address memory. RISC is hardwired, has a hardwired control unit, while CISC has a programmable control unit. So of these differences, I would recommend you at least learn five of them. Well, of course, the full forms are not uh, differences, but rather than that, it's good to know about five of them. Okay, we have SISD, single instruction, single data stream. There's only one processor. It can't parallel process because it has only one processor. It was found in earlier computers. So here we only have a single instruction and a single data stream. 
Next, we have SIMD, which would be single instruction, multiple data stream. They have multiple processors and every processor has several ALUs. They only have one instruction set, but there's multiple data streams. So each processor will execute the same instruction using data available in the dedicated memory on input. And they're used to process 3D graphics and such. MISD has multiple instructions, but only one data stream, which means it'll have multiple processors, each that process the same data. And they're used to sort large amounts of data, for example. Next, we have MIMD processors or multiple instruction, multiple data stream. It has multiple processors that each execute different instructions and the data is drawn from a common pool. So here we have multiple instructions and multiple data streams. They have a shared memory, which means that each processor has its own partition within the shared memory and is used mostly by parallel computer systems, such as in modern computers. One way to look at pipelining or instruction level parallelism is thinking about getting water to an alligator. So you have to use different pipes to increase the flow of water from each of the pipes so you can more efficiently transfer the water to the alligator so he can bath faster. Although I do not think the rubber ducks play much of a role in this. So you probably remember the von Neumann architecture. It had three stages. We had the fetch, decode and execute. And that would give us the fetch, decode, execute cycle. Well, in modern computers, we actually have five stages. And we will call these instructions. So for the first stage, we have the instruction fetch. The second stage, the second is the instruction decode. We have the operand fetch. So we fetch the operands. Next, we have the instruction fetch, instruction execute. And then finally, we have the write back. So each step here takes one clock cycle. Okay, now imagine we have one instruction. It would take five clock cycles. Okay, but what if we have three instructions? That would take five times three, 15 clock cycles. But what if, as soon as the first step, instruction fetch, for the first instruction was over, we started the instruction fetch for the second instruction. In this case, what we're doing is using instruction level parallelism. So when the first stage of an instruction is completed, the first stage of the next instruction can start executing already. Let's take a deeper look into this. So now we're looking at four instructions. We have instruction A, B, C, and D. And the ones marked with X are basically garbage. This is what we call pipelining. So when instructions A, B, C, and D are being processed, other instructions might also be executed. However, since we are only focusing on A, B, C, and D, we can consider the other instructions as garbage or what is marked in X. Um, as soon as D passes through, an other garbage instruction might also reach execution. So as soon as C is processed, the whole pipeline will be cleared for the next instructions to be executed. Now, there are three cases where the whole pipeline is cleaned. This is when there's garbage in the system. Or there is a jump instruction. Or maybe there would be an interrupt. So, as we remember that each one of the stages takes one clock cycle. So, this would mean if we have four instructions, right, that would usually take us four times five, which is 20 clock cycles. But this is without pipelining. If we use pipelining, what we can do is when instruction A has 
underground the stage instruction fetch, instruction B can already start or be executed. And similarly, C and D would already be, already be executed uh, by step four, right? And traditionally, if we would see, instruction D would, without pipelining, it would start on in cycle 15. Very slow. Pipelining helps greatly with this. So once A is executed, it goes to the next stage and B is already loaded. As you can see, it forms such uh, a diagonal structure over here. And we can now process four instructions in just eight clock cycles. Much faster, much more efficient. And this is basically the whole concept of pipelining. So although it may seem like pipelining doesn't have any issues and it works very well, this is not really the case. Um, there are some issues that can follow. Consider the following instruction add, and it takes in three registers. We have dest, which is the destination, and op1 and op2. Now op1 and op2 store the integers that we are going to add, or they could even be binary, uh, binary in fact. So a program counter contains the following three instructions add r3, r2, r1. This means these two are the integers we'll add and we'll store it in r3. So this would be r1 plus r2 stored in r3. And for the next one, we have r5 is the destination and we're gonna add r3 and r4. And similarly over here, we have r9 plus r8 stored in r10. So explain in this case why pipelining, pipelining would fail for the first two instructions. It might seem like everything is okay, but if you think hard enough and give it some time, you'll understand the problem. And let's look at this together after about 10 seconds, or you can pause the video and think a bit longer. Okay, so the reason is that the result of the first edition is not stored in R3, before the next instruction needs to load the value from R3. There will be a data dependency issue that R3 is being fetched and stored on the same clock pulse. Now, um, let me even explain this in a, well, a better way. See, first we have R1 that is being fetched. And then we have, first we have R2 that is being fetched. Then we have R1 and next we're storing it in R3. So this is clock cycle one two and three, right? So this is the first instruction, add R1, R2 to R3. And in fact, this should be the other way around that we are adding R2 to R1. That was my bad. And now what we're doing is for the next instruction, we're pipelining, right? So we get R4, R3, and in the fourth clock cycle, we store it in R5. The problem here is that R3 is both being, the value is being stored in R3 at the same time that it is being fetched. And this is an error. Uh, that's basically all that this says, right? It also says, how can the code above be optimized? Well, we can switch, off the, switch out the third instruction for the second instruction. And in that case, there will be no data dependency issue. A simple fix. Okay, so let's look at one more case. So consider the following sequence of instructions. Add R3, R2, R1. Add R6, R5, R4, JPE, which is jump if equal, R3, R6 loop. So the first one adds R1 to R2 and then stores it in R3. The second one adds R4 to R5 and stores it in R6. The third one compares R3 and R6, and if they are equal, it jumps to the address loop. Loop is not an, uh, in this case, it's not an operand. It's, it's just where the loop lies. The loop is basically an address, so it will jump to that position where the loop begins. The issue is the same here. The instruction has to know the value in the registers R3 and R6. These are not known as either instruction one or two have written the value to the register. This can cause the pipeline to stall. And 
as we've discussed before, this can also be called as a hazard, pipelining hazard. One strategy that pipelining can use to deal with this is branch prediction. The processor makes a guess at the outcome of the condition. Research shows that if the branch instruction is at the bottom of a loop, the execution will go back to the start of the loop in around 90% of the cases. Conditions at the start of the loop are true in 50% of the cases. Therefore, the strategy is just to assume that the condition is true in the first case and not true in the second case. If the guess proves to be wrong, then the processors must reinstate the register contents and start the pipeline again with the correct instruction. Now let's look at interrupt management in Siskin Rick's pipeline processors. So an interrupt is an event that alters the sequence in which the processor executes instructions. There's actually two types of interrupts, which you don't really have to remember anything about, but software and hardware. So for example, a hardware interrupt would be you clicking a right, making a right click on your mouse or pressing a key on your keyboard. This is basically an event, right? A right click is an event and that might alter the sequence in which the processor executes the instructions that it has in its memory already. So we have to understand how these interrupts are managed in the processor because they're very likely to happen indeed. Okay, so let's take for an example that an interrupt happens. There will be, let's say five instructions in the pipeline. One option is to clear the last four instructions in the pipeline and then the normal interrupt service routine runs. The ISR or the interrupt service routine. The other option is to construct the individual units in the processor with individual program counter registers. Now, this allows the current data to be stored for all the instructions in the pipeline while the interrupt is handled. That's basically it. And from our notes, let's take a, if you want to read, this is a better explanation that could be written down as an answer as well. So obviously they're in the notes and make sure to check the notes so you know what's going on. Okay, so now let's move on to the next thing, which is massively parallel computers. The name basically gives out half of whatever we need to know. Massive means it has many processors and, and parallel means to perform a set of coordinated computation in parallel. So let's break down the difference between what processors are and what processing units are. A massively parallel computer has many processors. Processor units are a part of a single processor. For example, a processor with four processing units is called a quad core, right? You've probably read this on your processor like the i7 octa-core processor or something right so these are a part of a single processor and they share the same bus there is only one processor here and when you say quad core it does not mean there are many processors massively parallel computers on the other hand have many processors which makes them very powerful we are also faced with some hardware and software issues when it comes to massively parallel computers well, communication between different processors is the issue as each processor needs a link to every other processor. And many processors require these links, so it will be a challenging topology. We're also faced with software issues. So a suitable programming language is needed that allows data to be processed by multiple processors simultaneously. So changes are required to a normal program code when being transferred to a massively parallel computer. 
these are that it will be have it will have to be split into blocks of code that can be processed simultaneously instead of sequentially makes sense so if you have four pieces of bread you want to bake you won't bake all of them in the same oven you'll bake them in four different ovens this terminology might not make much sense because an oven can usually bake four breads but imagine if you have 60 breads right you won't bake 10 after 10 in several batches, you'll bake them in 10 different ovens. Each block is processed by a different processor, or which allows each of many processors to simultaneously process the different blocks of data independently. And it requires both parallelism and coordination. That's all for today. See you guys in the next one.